Greetings, everyone. I am F. Keith Slaughter, senior servant of the beloved Community Church of Atlanta. Our ministry began five years ago with a few dedicated souls who were dedicated to serving our people and worshiping our God. We are a small church. However, since we began, we have slowly grown from a mere idea into a thriving, busy, and dynamic presence in the Pittsburgh community of Atlanta, Georgia. The coronavirus pandemic indelibly altered the work of our ministry. The food and resources gap between the poor and others has widened right before our eyes. As the world around us changed, we recognized the need to expand our already established food pantry to include a food sharing component for children and adults in our community. We now serve hot meals, sandwiches, snacks, and beverages three days a week and provide emergency food pantry access throughout the week. The times required that we expand our capacity to serve, but we had inadequate facilities needed to do the work. To that end, we recently acquired a historic Pittsburgh landmark formerly known as Little Zion Baptist Church. Our plan is to transition our food pantry and resource brokerage center, including a new day shelter component, and to the Little Zion Annex of the beloved community church. We need room to grow, and I need your help to make it happen. The food pantry will give community members and their families access to nutritious food in a clean and healthy environment. The Resource Brokerage Center will connect persons to information and benefits available to them, while the day shelter will create space for showers and personal care cell phone recharging stations, and other help for our unsheltered sisters and brothers. So here's the ask. I'm asking you to be mindful and prayerful around your possible role in helping us to take care of some good people who need to feel the experience of human love, care, and compassion in the midst of their struggle. After considering the possibilities, I ask that you would share your best gift with us to help us renovate the building, put on a new roof, replace the damaged flooring, and rebuild the handicap ramp to make it a bright, healthy, secure space for healing and restoration to occur. I believe that this is good ground. Won't you help us by investing in making Dr. King's vision of the beloved community a blessed reality? You can help us by cash apping us at dollar sign, the beloved community. You may also go to my website, drfkeithslaughter.org, and make a PayPal donation. But however you give, make sure you give to this good and worthy cause. sense. We have to go and do it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, what I man say. Right now, now, now. But each and every day I say. Oh, people now. Yeah, I say. Freedom.
<laughs> Y'all know what it is. Uh, I can't sit at the seat of the scorn for. Run away, run away, run away. Those wolves are sheep clothing. Come on, come on. Run away. Uh, Take back what you stole from me. <laughs> Compensate. They keep lying, Yo. man, and I can't relate. Run away, run away, run away. This Slaughter D call me Trap Pastor. Uh, I talk slow, but you know I rap fast. Yeah, right. Hard rhymes, I'm as serious as cancer. Uh, Recognize you ain't a slave, you a master. Mm. Came here on the bottom of the boat. Yeah, right. Can't flow, so I had to backstroke. Uh, Coming up on the verses that I rode. Every day I slang hope, not dough. dough. Black excellence, down with the team. Malcolm X nightmare, my Luther's dream. Uh, Fight the power, can you feel what I mean? Like Rock Kim said, I'm, I'm a microphone fiend. Came south on a special invitation. I say a word on the current situation. Uh, no delay, no more hesitation. <laughs> Are you fist up? Take your reparation, sucker. <laughs> Y'all know what it is. <laughs> Come on, can't sit the seat of the scornful. Woo! Run away, run away, run away. Those wolves are sheep clothing. Come on, come on. Run away. Uh. Take back what you stole from me. <laughs> Compensate. <laughs> they keep lying, Yo. man, and I can't relate. Run away, run away, run away. Yeah, so you think you can run away from reality? You think you can run away from the problems? You think you can find yourself someplace else to go where there's no God? Hey man, wherever you go, God is already there waiting on you. So stop running. <laughs>
I'm glad I'm not a parent now uh, because my children probably would not be getting vaccinated. And I wouldn't want to go through all of the back and forth involved with that. At any rate, I generally didn't. Well, my children only went to public school one year, you know, because that one year, the people came to my house talking about my kids were late for school. And, <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> my kids ain't late. I be late. <laughs> so, but you can't tell me what to do. I'm an adult. <laughs> you can only tell my children what to do, and I tell them what to do too. And they depend on me for a ride to school. So it ain't that they late, it's that I'm late. So what you gonna do to me? And they was like, hey, we can do something to you because you late. So I was like, okay, this is what we do. We cut back in a whole lot of areas so that we can afford, so we can pay for private school because I can't have no people outside of my house telling me nothing about how I get down in my house and how I get down with my children. But this seeming insistence that children be vaccinated. And let's just be clear, the, the data just isn't in on what the long-term impacts will be of these vaccinations on children. That's not anti-vaxxer talk, that's reality. But currently, people are in, engaged in a type of groupthink a type of collectivism, collectivism rather, as it relates to the, the spirit of the times, the, the Zeitgeist. People are uh, polarized into different camps of opinion as it relates to this vaccine, these vaccines and who they are to be used upon and who it is appropriate for them to be used upon. As I've always said, if you would like the vaccine, I think that you should have it. But the people who don't want it, I don't think should be forced to have it. At this point in this country, the statistics, the, the data show that over 211 million people have been vaccinated thus far. And of course, in a country of approximately 350 million people, uh, that's a pretty large percentage. And so I think that what we must do is be true to ourselves, be true to our own family values and not allow others to run our families, particularly when we're being asked to have something injected in our bodies and all of the research is not in as of yet. That's the situation. But you want to know what the deal is. Beep, 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 beep. I see you, Eddie. Hey, Dr. Lipman, I see you. What's good, man? You? You're doing good. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, so you want to know what the deal is, and I want to share with you what it is I've learned since the last time I spoke with you. Um, so, of course, I'm not looking at football, but I saw most of one of the games yesterday. And... Um, I was disappointed. <laughs> so, so, yeah, well, you could get used to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, what's going on in the world? In 
let's see here. Do okay. I got a story about Ethiopia. I got a story about um, Kenya, and I have a story about Mali. Let me just share with you, however, uh, that tensions in our, are at an all-time high in Burkina Faso, where a coup has taken place, and the military has suspended the constitution of the country. Uh, there, there, are, there are dire, dire concerns in that area of the continent. Also, uh, out of Mali, African News is reporting that Malian Foreign Minister Abdullaye Jop revealed that tensions between Paris and Bamako were due to the fact that the Malian junta had touched France's interests by ruling out elections in February. So the minister further indicated that France is pushing for another set of rulers to govern Mali. Are you listening? Have I not been telling you this for, I don't know, the last year? That because Mali is a neo-colony of France and France is near bankruptcy that they are calling in all markers. And this is what's happening in Mali. The minister had earlier blamed France for supporting coups in the country in the past. In a video that has been verified by Malian authorities, the minister said that France had in the past claimed to have defended democracy in other countries by installing heads of state who carried out coups. And so, yeah, it, that's African news, right? Google it. It's there, it's there. And it's what I've been saying. If, if, if Am I lying? I have been saying this every day. And now, finally, there's a news report that verifies what I have been saying. And the same thing is true as it relates to... Uh, to other places of unrest, uh, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, which I shared with you at the outset, uh, is a neo-colony of France. It was colonized by France, and France is in trouble. And so they are exploiting the resources, the natural resources that are found in the countries wherein they have installed governments. And if those who are running the government, refuse to give them what they want at the terms that they want them at, then they change governments. They orchestrate a coup and they shut down the country until they can get what they want. What the hell? Hell yeah, that's how it goes down. Um, Ethiopian Airlines employees are fleeing the country by hiding in planes. This is according to CNN. Um, people are escaping from Ethiopia because uh, there are emergency laws that are in effect and they have targeted ethnic Tigrayans and uh, the government denies that the laws are targeting any particular group. Um, and they did l recently lift the state of emergency, but the reality is, uh, is that there are people who work for airlines who are using their proximity to planes uh, to stow away on those planes and gain escape from the country in fear of the warfare that is going on there. Out of Nairobi, Voices of Africa, Mohammed Youssef gets the byline for this story. The French embassy in Kenya has issued a terror alert to Western nationals, urging them to avoid places uh, where foreigners gather, such as hotels and shopping centers, especially in the capital, Nairobi. The German embassy sent the country's citizens a less specific terror alert using caution. Kenyan police say that they have seen the terror alert and have beefed up their security. And I wonder what that is all about. We don't know now, but what we do know is that Kenya 
is a colony of England. And so whatever is happening there that is causing unrest, you can directly connect it to those in Britain and in the U.S. who have, quote, interest there. Closer to home. Yep. Closer to home. Uh, Um, So, the Roots, Alexandra Jane, is reporting that affirmative action has been under attack since its inception in the 1960s. Um, But last Monday, the Supreme Court stated that it would hear two cases opposing race conscious admissions at the University of North Carolina as well as at Harvard University. However, experts say that black and Latino students would be harmed at disproportionate rates if the Supreme Court ruling favors reversing its policy on affirmative action programs in the U.S. You can look forward to affirmative action probably being uh, rolled back and within within the year as this next session of the Supreme Court meets. It is all, the, the court is majority conservative and it is, and conservative means white supremacist and it's a white supremacist issue. Uh, well, that's what affirmative action is. Uh, white supremacists don't want fairness and Uh, equality of opportunity. What they want is exclusivity and the ability to be able to claim first deals on everything of value. But what I hope this does and what it hopefully will do is it will also hopefully cut down on the number of white professors that are found in HBCUs and hopefully increase the number of students that attend HBCUs because they will not be allowed to attend the PWIs that has been siphoning them away in a type of brain drain to another space. All right? So this could be a good thing. Let them get rid of affirmative action if they want to. Fine. Maybe we'll begin to work for each other, work with each other, develop our own businesses and stop looking to others to give us opportunities that we could establish for ourselves. It's just a thought. Um, I think I share with you um, that um, Stephen Breyer a liberal Supreme Court justice has announced his retirement coming up at the end of this session of the Supreme Court. Uh, And so uh, James Clyburn, uh, House Democrat from South Carolina, uh, backed a federal judge from his home state to replace uh, Stephen Breyer, even predicting that the choice would garner Republican support in the Senate. Uh, News broke last week that Breyer uh, was about to retire. He's 83 years old. And of course, during his campaign, uh, Joe Biden is famously uh, recorded as pledging uh, to a point to appoint a black woman to the Supreme Court if a vacancy came. A vacancy is coming. And so he is honoring what he said he would do, which you know, you would expect someone to do to honor their word. However, there is pushback, and pushback has already begun, even as he has uh, shared a short list of persons who he is considering for the position, all black women, all highly capable. Uh, However, the pushback now is uh, what, uh, what is it? 70% of quote Americans and remember Mitch McConnell does not include black people as Americans right so 70% of Americans supposedly think that the Supreme Court nomination 
ought to be uh, coming from the pool, the general pool of people who are um, appropriate for the position, not just choosing from black women. And that is just the most hypocritical shit I've heard in a while. You know and I know <laughs> uh, that up until the last 20 damn years, every appointment has been 20 or 30 years, every appointment uh, has been drawn out of one pool of persons, which are crusty-ass white men, straight up. So they ought to be ashamed of themselves, but of course they're not. So um, uh, Martha C. White of NBC Black is reporting that small, small businesses are in many ways the back bone of the American economy and in a society in which racial disparities in income, asset accrual, and economic mobility remain challenges. Entrepreneurship is one of the most effective pathways for historically marginalized Americans to earn, grow, and pass on wealth. We know that, and we're learning that in the midst of this coronavirus era, uh, that many people are deciding uh, to move on from being employed uh, by corporations or other uh, larger entities and people are starting their own businesses and learning what it means to uh, work for themselves. Now, minority entrepreneurs, yeah. But, but the thing about it is and, this is, and this is the difference between black people starting businesses and white people starting businesses. White people start their businesses with other people's money. Black people start their businesses with their own money, which means there's inherently more risk for financial failure and for a family's finances being ruined as opposed to a business's finances being ruined by failure of the business. And uh, minority entrepreneurs aren't creating the same number of jobs that they would if they had more financial resources. And as the pandemic drags into its third year, the clock is actually ticking on black businesses, even as the fate of Build Back Better remains uncertain. The Biden administration is seeking other channels to promote greater economic equity, the report says. Um, and so, um, but there is also other data that arise that shows that as it relates to those PPP loans, which you always hear about black people uh, being accused of misusing the funds. Well, the reality is, is that 79% of white owned businesses received all of the funding for which they applied through the PPP program. Only 43% of black owned companies got everything that they asked for. So if you factor that in to these reports about black misuse of the funding, uh, I bet you if they did an in-depth uh, investigation of how the funds were used by whites, they just knew how to funnel it to the, to the correct spaces and do the creative uh, ways of accounting whereby it is hidden that they have used the funds to purchase things for themselves. I bet you you would find it if you did some serious forensic accounting. Yeah, I bet you. Anyway, finally, locally. All right, y'all, it's a problem. I got a problem. Houston, there's a problem. Uh, John Shurick is reporting here in Atlanta that there, the city of Atlanta, the city council or a particular city council member is targeting the Blue Flame Lounge to be closed. The Blue Flame Lounge in Northwest Atlanta is now the target of at least one city council member 
who wants the city to revoke the club's liquor license and shut it down, accusing the club of having a notorious reputation for repeated violent crimes. The latest crime uh, is a young man by the name of Deshaun Marquise Lee Herndon, age 21, uh, who was murdered uh, uh, by... Um, allegedly by a young man by the name of Diedrich Howard, who was 25 in the parking lot at the Blue Flame. And they're reporting that uh, because of violent episodes that have occurred at different nightclubs in Atlanta, that they want to clamp down on these establishments. Um, the majority of the incidences of uh, violence have taken place in northwest Atlanta, I mean, excuse me, northeast Atlanta, in the Buckhead region, and I can understand people um, in that area of the city not wanting violence to be visited upon them. But if that's the case, if the violence is primarily happening in the northeast portion of the city, why concentrate or target clubs and businesses in the southwest or the northwest portion of the city is my question. And, you know, I, I just wonder, um, Dustin Hillis is that Atlanta City Council member who wants to revoke the Blue Flame Lounge's liquor license. And um, so, I, I don't know. The Blue Flame... I must say, is an Atlanta treasure. I just a couple of weeks ago, I guess a month ago, right before Christmas, uh, my I took my sons and I went to the Blue Flame Lounge, and we enjoyed uh, the atmosphere. I didn't detect any violence in the midst of uh, the celebrations that were taking place, and. My sons and I actually had an enjoyable afternoon of um, tasteful <laughs> adult entertainment. And so we'll see how that goes and if they're able to close the blue flame. I don't know. Hopefully not. Uh, because I think it's hypocritical of people. I really do think it's hypocritical of people. To, uh, to pretend that human beings don't like looking at other human beings who are naked, who are nude. I think it's just the most hypocritical, and I, and I say that as, as your local pastor. It's, it's hypocritical to pretend that people don't like adult entertainment. People like that and have liked it since the beginning <laughs> of human beings. <laughs> Being human, uh, you, and so I, I, you know, I don't know. I just can't. I can't join people in their fake, false outrage. I can't join people uh, in in their fantasies of the purity of humankind. Not able to join you there. I'm clear uh, that people are offended by different things, uh, but it also always confuses me that people find offense at the human body. I, I just can't join you in that. So Now here's something I can join you with. A, the Environmental Protection Agency is leading an investigation into a health threat of a neighboring metal processing plant uh, here in Atlanta along the back fence of the Crawford W. Long Middle School. Um, there's a facility that's located immediately behind the school and is separated only by a steep hill, a fence, uh, and a creek. And samples from the school and the creek that runs behind it were collected uh, a couple of weeks ago and they're waiting to see what these uh, samples reveal. However, you will know and I know that environmental racism is real. And where there are plants that spill toxic fluids and chemicals uh, into the ground, into uh, creek water, is generally in neighborhoods 
that are occupied by black people and brown people and poor people. So, uh, you know, it's in the soil, it's in the water. And um, so now the UPA, the EPA is threatening to do something about it. And that is what grosses me out. Not seeing a naked woman shake it on a pole. Okay. All right. Finally, and this is something else that grosses me out. The, um, the pornographic amount of money that is raised and shared and passed from hand to hand in politics. Um, that's, that, that offends me, okay? The Atlanta Voices, Russ Bynum uh, and Associated Press is reporting that Raphael Warnock uh, said Wednesday that he has raised $9.8 million in the last quarter. Uh, 2021, bringing him up to uh, a total of around $23 million raised for a campaign, sisters and brothers. That offends me. That's pornographic to me. Because what happens to that money, really? And you're going to you want to actually tell me that somebody is going to get twenty three million dollars that they have access to use in a quote campaign. And there is going to be that everything is going to be above board and every penny of that money is going to be accounted for. You can't make me believe that. And he's raised more money than uh, this other dude, this jerk. um uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the football dude, uh, Herschel, Herschel Walker, who was just awful. Who's just an awful human being, just terrible, in my view. And he's running against Warnock, and he might win. We'll see. I mean, this is uh, again. If if you want to make me disgusted, don't get on the pole and shake. You want to make me disgusted. Flash millions and millions of dollars that are basically, basically unaccounted for and coming from persons all over the country. They've gotten, for this race that's happening in Georgia, both of those candidates have gotten money from all 50 states. Okay? So people from around this country are sending money to Georgia so that Warnock and Walker can pay off media to advertise them. And to me, that is obscene. Anyway, so now you know the deal. And that's what it is. When we come back, I got special guests in the studio. One person who I hadn't seen for a couple of years and looking forward uh, to talking to one of the uh, for, foremost authorities in the area of uh, women's issues uh, that have to do with uh, uterine fibroids. Uh, so I want you to stay tuned. This could very well be a helpful interview for you to hear. My sisters and my brothers who are connected with sisters. The name of the show is The Situation. And Dr. Lipman is coming up on the other side of the break. I want you to stay tuned for him. My name is Slaughter. I'm the machine, the trap pastor. I be get, get, getting it every day, Monday through Thursday, from around 11-ish till around 1-ish on this thing, sit, call the situation. And so I want you to go to trappastor.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, choose a platform upon which you may view this, the dopest show you never heard of, as we traffic in truth-telling, kicking off this Monday with your brother, also, we got the chicken, man. Sat Town Pub, our sponsor. I want you to go and check them out. 5819 Campbellton Road in the city of South Fulton, man. Uh, they see about us, so we see about them. Much love to Frederica Jones. I will see y'all on the other. Who is that? Is that So Nine or who is that? 
That's a uh, yeah. That's Josie. Yeah, that's Josie right there behind me and up under me. Uh, y'all check out Josie, man. Josie is dope. Uh, he make the dope sounds. You feel me? Uh, make sure you go on Apple Music or wherever and cop his stuff. All right. I see y'all on the other side of the break. My name is Slaughter, and guess what? We're open. We're open. Yes, we're open. We are open, and Sandtown Pub is ready to serve you. We're taking precautions, wearing masks, wearing gloves, sanitizing, and practicing social distancing. We've even partnered with local leaders to hand out free masks. So stop by and enjoy our outdoor patio, dine in, call ahead for pickup, Get Uber Eats and DoorDash delivery or order online at www.sandtownpub.com. Peace family, it's your girl Shelly Amonset with Sun Goddess Sense, your one-stop natural shop. We are located at 4140 Jonesboro Road, booth 225, inside the Forest Park International Discount Mall in Forest Park, Georgia. Come check us out. You can get your health and beauty items, aromatherapy, skin care, pan-African apparel, and more. You can reach us at 404-434-7963 or sungoddess underscore sense on IG or sungoddess.sense on IG or sungoddess sense like page on Facebook. Peace. Hi, I'm Broderick Gooch. And I'm Tian Gooch. And, and we're, we're Gooch's, Gooch's Goodies. Goodies. Here at Gooch's Goodies, we specialize in delivering smiles and satisfaction to your home with our high quality foods at affordable prices. Our signature sauces and dishes will guarantee a flavor that your family will love. And that's a Gooch's Goodies guarantee. You can follow us on Facebook, DoorDash, and Grubhub. See, See you soon. soon.
Welcome back to the show. Slaughter. The situation. Uh, my next guest is a board certified interventional radiologist and renowned authority in the non surgical treatment of uterine fibroids. Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, please join me in welcoming dear friend of the situation, none other than Dr. John. Lipman, Dr. Lipman. Wow, what's going on, Thund- man? Thunderous applause. Hell yeah! What wow. you think? I thought you knew, Doc. Thunderous! Wow, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for yeah, having man, me, man. Man, glad to see you, man. Glad you're here, brother. Uh, you are, uh, are a. Uh, well, it actually, it's, it's good to see you because I hadn't seen you in a couple of years now since before. Yeah. Uh, COVID nineteen. Yes, pre COVID. W A O K. Yeah, back in the back in the, the old days. Yes, uh, in, in the prehistoric era. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but uh, the pre coronavirus era. It's it's good to see you, Doc, and and I think that is important for us uh, to have this conversation. But before we get into the conversation about uh, about uterine fibroids and non surgical. Uh, modalities of treatment for uh, that particular dis-ease. Uh, we was bumping Josie Fuller. Uh, 
<laughs> and I couldn't think of Josie's last name. And so Dr. Lippman pulls out his phone and on his playlist is he says, Oh, that's dangerous by Josie Fuller. I'm like, get the hell out of here, man. <laughs> what the, the hell you know about Josie Fuller, man? And he says, Don't judge a book by its cover. Okay. All right, uh, Dr. Lippman. A, a quick uh, story. My, I, I was asked to speak to a group of African American physicians. Mm. on fibroids mm. and the entertainment that night was Simon Alexander good mm -hmm. good friend of mine I didn't yeah. know Simon at the time but I had heard of him mm -hmm. uh, and this was many years ago famous and we supposed to be praying for Simon yes too, absolutely very... please say a prayer for my brother from another yeah. mother yeah. that's who he yeah. uh, Simon uh, Simon baby but mm. um, so we went to this event and my they're playing he's playing the music and he's asking for requests so my daughter at the time was now in her mid twenties. She was like seven or eight. Mm -hmm. Runs up to the stage, mm -hmm. and he's he's this big imposing guy mm -hmm. on stage, looking down at her and going like, "I, I got mm -hmm. nothing here for you," mm -hmm. you know, asking for requests. Uh, and he, so he go, you know he's thinking, you know, what is he going to say? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, or something mm -hmm. like that. So he goes, "Okay, like, what's your request?" He goes, "She goes, do you have anything by Parliament?" Right, and right. I was like, "What?" What do you know about yeah. Parliament? Because <laughs> yeah. that's what she heard in my car, flashlight. Right. So he stopped everything and said, I'm going to play what she just requested. You won't believe this. He Hell, flashlight. Yeah. So you just, you know, you don't know. It's a beautiful thing. You never. And we've been friends ever since. So yeah. he's, he's that's, super guy. That's a, that's a, that's a cool, cool story, Sideman story. Yeah, Sideman is, is wrestling with a, yeah. with a, a debilitating dis-ease now. And it's interesting. I think it's, he's, Dealing with um, pancreatic, pancreatic cancer. Yeah. Pancreatic cancer, and, yeah. So you we're, know, we're I had for him. I had pancreatitis, man, and um, you know, lost like fifty pounds in two weeks. You yeah, know, it's, it's it's a it's a crazy thing. Made it through though. Um, Doc, you got like certifications and um, you know, just you are at the height of your profession. Um, by by all accounts, you're at the height of your profession. How, how did you originally um, come to the come to the specialty of non-surgical intervention in a in a world and in a space where surgery is right. what doctors want right. to do? How did you come it's, to this It's one approach? of the newest specialties. It's only been around for about 50 years now. Mm. And when I was back in medical school in the mid-80s, I had heard about a guy doing just, you know, incredible things non-surgically. Mm. Uh, and so I wrote to him and said, you know, I've got some elective time. Uh, I was at Georgetown Medical School at the time, and he was in just across the bridge in Virginia doing stuff. Mm. And I said, I got some elective time. Could I spend some time with you? And I spent... A month with him during and i just couldn't believe the stuff he was doing i mean mm. saving people non-surgically uh doing all this stuff from the inside and he's an interventional radiologist and he's now an icon you know in the field mm. um he uh is the he founded the miami cardiac and vascular institute in miami mm. uh, but at the time he would say he was in this small suburban hospital you know, in Virginia, rural, you know, well, not rural, uh, suburban Virginia mm. and kind of under the radar. And I'd heard about him and there was an article written about him and I was like, man, this is, and it's, it's the coolest specialty is the coolest thing ever. So we're doing non-surgical procedures all over the body, treating, uh, stroke, cancer, peripheral vascular disease, um, infertility. In my case, I do a non-surgical procedure that replaces hysterectomy for women suffering with fibroids. Mm. Women with fibroids, even though fibroids are benign tumors, mm. they comment the most common reason why we do hysterectomy in this country is not for cancer, which would be appropriate. It's for these benign tumors. And so it's the second most- Second most common, common surgery, surgery. Done, done in the United States. And mm. it fibroids affect 80% of African-American women. So why are we essentially wow. amputating black women for benign disease. Because if you look racially at who gets hysterectomies, Caucasian women get hysterectomies for cancer, mm -hmm. which is appropriate. Mm -hmm. Black women get 
hysterectomy is most commonly for fibroids. Why, why are we doing that? Right. You don't need to do that. Right. Well, I mean, of course, I'm, from my perspective, I'm kind of clear on why that is. Well, it, and that's, uh, you know, it's a, a, a eugenics kind of thing. It's a, uh, it's a, you know, a targeted, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the, the Mississippi appendectomy. Missis- and Fannie Lou Hamer, yeah. Mississippi appendectomy. Yeah, right. I mean, well, there's, there's certainly a layer of that. There's, there's yeah. no question that that uh, plays into it. it. It's also something, you know, medicine is very resistant to change. Once you get mm-hmm. into a certain pattern, you know, pharmaceutical reps know that once they get their docs prescribing certain medication, it's hard to get for them to change. Mm-hmm. So change doesn't happen very quickly, particularly in medicine. Yeah. And hysterectomy was the thing that was just done and no one questioned it. Um, and fortunately now, in fact, I just heard of a, a new series that OWN is going to do, the Oprah Winfrey Network, mm. conversations about fibroids. It's way overdue. Women have been suffering with these benign tumors for years, and no one was talking about it. So let's, let's just get down to brass tacks. What's the cause of fibroids? Well, nobody knows where they come from, but once they arrive, they grow with estrogen hormones. That's why they can mm. grow rapidly during a woman when she's pregnant and why it tends not to be an issue for women typically once they're in menopause, Mm -hmm. but nobody knows where they come from because we haven't spent any money on research. You see all this research for cancer and AIDS and heart disease, Mm -hmm. very little research on fibroids. And you're saying that, and and the statistics show that 80% of black women get them, which means only 20% of white women get them, which is your, is that your answer right there, right? No, uh, I would say probably somewhere in the 40 to 40% range uh, of for white, white women. women. Okay. You know, so it's not, it's more, much okay. more common in black women, but mm. women of all races get them. It's just mm. the most racially African American women get them more than any other racial group, Asian mm. women, the lowest incidence, and then mm. everyone else kind of, you know, falls in between. Has there been, or is there any research that looks specifically at diet and the relationship it, between diet and, and it's, fibroids? It's definitely a factor as I said, hormones make fibroids grow, particularly estrogen. And, right. and hormones, unfortunately, are pervasive in the food supply, even in the drinking water. So yeah. we try to tell patients, try to avoid the hormone-rich foods, red meat, non-organic chicken, dairy, and try to beef up on colored fruits and vegetables because they have flavonoids in them, which block an important enzyme in estrogen production. So mm. increase your colored fruits and vegetables, Try to limit hormone-rich foods. You can try to exercise because exercise will, you know, you'll lose excess body fat. Estrogen Mm -hmm. is stored and produced in body fat. Again, one of the reasons (laughs) it is, you know, that African-American women disproportionately suffer is they, in general, have more body fat on them than other racial groups. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're more likely to get fibroids. They get them earlier in life. They get them bigger, more numerous, and they're more likely to get hysterectomy than anyone else. But... You can't really pick your parents. That's a genetic thing. There's a genetic predisposition for fibroids in black women. You can't mm-hmm. do anything about that. But you can do some of these other things. You can try to eat better. You can try to lose excess body fat. Uh, vitamin D is really important. Vitamin D is a very powerful anti-fibroid growth hormone. It's actually a hormone technically, not a vitamin. Um, mm. Only 10% of African-American men or women have adequate vitamin D. It's because we get it through absorption in the skin Mm -hmm. and the darker the pigmentation of your skin, the harder it is to get adequate vitamin D. So we try to check vitamin D levels to make sure that they're adequate. Um, That's important. Hair relaxers, even though that's not as much of an important thing now as more women are having their hair natural. Back in the day, I used to see a lot of women that were using hair relaxers. And if you look at the main ingredient in it, it's very similar to estrogen. So Mm -hmm. essentially you know, kind of the scalp is very vascular and they would, right. you know, get a lot more estrogen like compounds in the system. So it's multifactorial, but there are things, certain things we can do and certain things we have no control over. Mm. So, um, so with your work, then more than likely you see a, a large number of black women and black, black, oh, black uh, women patients. My practice is probably 90% black women. Interesting. And what is your success rate with treating this 90, disease? 90% of patients get significant relief or complete resolution of all their symptoms from fibroids, whether it's heavy menstrual periods, that's the most common reason why women have heavy periods, mm-hmm. pelvic pain, urinary frequency, 
constipation, painful sex, whatever the, these fibroids are hard and firm and they press on things. Mm. So it's the most common reason why women have heavy periods, uh, but whatever the symptom is that they're causing, nine out of 10 will be able to get the relief they're looking for without any surgery whatsoever. They go home the same day with a band aid. That's it. No surgery, no hospital, no general anesthesia. They leave the same day with a band aid. That's it. You know, doc, wow. you know, and, and again, we've, we've, I've interviewed you uh, at least a couple of times before, yes. and we've talked about um, just the, the, the frequency and the, um, of this disease as it relates to, to black women. Um, what should be done, do you think, from, from, your, from your space, from your, from your view? Mm-hmm. What, what is the thing that black women can do mm-hmm. to try to avoid uh, having to uh, uh, deal with fibroid well, issues? There's, there's a couple of things. One, increase the conversation in the community. Women, it's, a, it's an embarrassing topic to talk about your periods. There's a lot of taboo socially against talking about your periods, not only amongst even women, mm-hmm. but women and men. Um, men have to get into this conversation because if they're with a woman, they may be facing these issues and have to understand it. I, I can say this because she went public with it, but I treated Cynthia Bailey from Real Housewives. Peter didn't understand at all. He just... Mm. You know, when you're bleeding so heavily with fibroids and, you know, you're wearing, you know, these all sorts of gear and pads and even diapers, mm-hmm. you're gushing and flooding. It's, it's embarrassing. Um, and, and it's also draining physically because you're losing a lot of blood each month. Mm-hmm. So they're tired and weak. And so the relations between Cynthia and Peter stopped. Mm-hmm. And all from his perspective was, well, I'm not getting mine. She must mm-hmm. not love me. Mm-hmm. She, she loved him, but she was going through this and he didn't understand it. And then once we got to an understanding and he realized what she was going through and she got the UFE procedure with, with us um, and she got her life back and she said, I gave her her sexy back. That's great. Mm-hmm. Relations, you know, resumed and she, she got her life back and she was thrilled. So the point is the men don't understand this and they need to understand this. They need to understand what their women are going through and empathize with this and support them. Mm-hmm. So conversations, mother, daughter, sisters, talking about fibroids, talking about periods. It's not taboo. It's important mm-hmm. to talk about. It's a huge health issue. And so converse, increase the conversation, increase the research. Mm-hmm. There is, uh, there's legislation in both houses, uh, the Stephanie Tubbs Jones uh, Fibroid Research and Education Act. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a Senate side of that with Cory Booker being the lead on that. Um, on the House side, it's a representative from New York. Um, supported by the vice president. Um, and so we've got to get this research act through. It's mm-hmm. going to increase. It's going to give much needed funding to find out where fibroids come from mm-hmm. so that we can finally, you know, address, address that and also increase the education, not only to the public, but to physicians to know about procedures like UFE, which, you know, uterine fibroid embolization is one of the biggest medical breakthroughs for women particularly women of color who disproportionately suffer with fibroids, but Mm. nobody knows to ask about it. All they hear about is surgery, Mm. either, either deal with it or get operated on. Mm. And you don't need, we can replace hysterectomies um, that are due, that are done for fibroids completely with procedures like UFE, but you got to know about it. Uh, Instead, there's a lot of women just suffer in silence over a million women are suffering in silence because they don't want surgery. I don't blame them. They don't want a hysterectomy because there's lots of issues with that, Mm. but they don't know about UFE. Do do you uh, experience or have you experienced any pushback from mainstream uh, physicians and, and, and the, uh, what I call the, uh, the healthcare (laughs) industrial system? Uh, Certainly. Yes. Mm. Because any kind of disruptive technology, and this has been around for a long time, we've been doing, uh, I did one of the first, you know, UFEs done here in Georgia many years ago, mm. um, and that's what we're known for at the Atlanta Fibroid Center is, mm. is doing this UFE procedure. But of course, any disruptive technology, whether it's in medicine or any other industry, is very threatening to those that have the status quo. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you're if you're in the candle industry and making candles and everything 
all the everyone every household relies on the candle and all of a sudden edison comes along with a light bulb it's very threatening to those that make their livelihood on candles mm, yeah or lewis latimer who made the light bulb that worked okay <laughs> okay uh, you, you uh, get my point i get your point yeah of course <laughs> um i want would, would you talk about um the the wrinkle that COVID-19 uh, and moving into the coronavirus era has brought as relates to people accessing the treatment that you Well, offer. it certainly was very difficult and remains a challenge. I mean, initially it was kind of we were shut down like a lot of places were shut down. And then we had to try to work through, you know, how do we still provide an important service because um, the hospitals were completely shut down because of the ICUs were full. So they couldn't do any elective procedures. Our procedure is outpatient and elective. Mm. And so we were an important resource, kind of a safety valve uh, for the hospitals and to still provide an important service for the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and it remains a challenge because, you know, there's ebbs and flows with this. And, you know, we doing the best we can to try to um, stay open and stay and provide this much needed service to our community. Mm. Oh. When you know, and I mentioned um, coronavirus, and interesting uh, data was that uh, the last I checked, it was something like thirty some percent of medical professionals refusing mm -hmm. to uh, receive the vaccine. What what do you what do you think that's about? Of what do you, what, why why do you think that medical professionals, in particular, and it's, I think the rate is even higher among African American medical professionals? Why do, why do you think well, that that is? I would I'm just guessing because I, I am vaccinated. I did get the vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, those that don't get the vaccine, if they're particularly um, individuals of color, mm -hmm. you know, based on our history of you know, medical experimentation. Mm. Uh, and so there may be a, a reluctance because of our, of that history. And that mm. it's understandable. Um, you know, it, it seemed like this technology kind of was, you know, rushed uh, forward, even though it was claimed that, you know, the, the backbone of it was, you know, well tested, but we did kind of get it, you know, quickly. And so some may be reluctant to trust something that, you know, was somewhat developed, at least the part of it developed fairly quickly and not given the time that a lot of things in medical research, you know, can take years to, mm -hmm. to make sure that this is something safe and effective. Because, you know, there has been issues in the past where we had uh, things in medicine brought quickly, um, you know, the what comes to mind, the thalidomide uh, stuff, it, yeah. was a, it was a treatment for a radiation kind for of sickness. You know, some women would get very sick and throw up during their early pregnancy. And so this medication was given to treat the morning sickness. The problem mm. was it caused birth defects. So right. in this case, you know, the cure supposedly, oops, the mm. cure was worse than the disease. Right. And it was harmful. So um, you have to be careful. And yeah. uh, so I think some of the reluctance there may have been you know, historical and the perception that this was maybe brought quickly and too quick. Okay. So if there is someone who might be looking, paying attention to us now, uh, and who might be experiencing pain associated uh, with fibroids, how would you suggest that they make contact with you? Well, that's these days with the internet, it's very easy to find me. Um, we're at the Atlanta Fibroid Center, I'm the founder of the Atlanta Fibroid Center here in Atlanta. It's in Smyrna. Um, so there's a website, atlii.com. Mm -hmm. That's our website. That's the parent company, Atlanta Interventional Institute. So atlii.com, or if they're uh, Instagram, it's dr underscore my last name. So it's dr underscore L-I-P-M-A-N. Uh, or they can uh, go on YouTube. There's numerous videos on fibroids and UFE that they could look at Atlanta Fibroid Center, or they can do the old fashioned way and just call the office, uh, 770-953-2600. Cool. Put, flash that up on, on there, uh, create, let's see the, yep. let's see the, there's the okay. website. Mm -hmm. Are you ready to be fibroid free? 
with UFE. All right. Home the same day with a Band-Aid. That's it, a Band-Aid. Hey, are you, I, I really want sisters to to get hip to this and to, and to pick up on this thing because, I mean, it, it if one could avoid uh, the, the trauma to the body associated with surgery – uh, and get another procedure that is just as uh, uh, effective, and then I don't see why people wouldn't opt yeah, to do it, that. It's just a, it's a not knowing that this option exists is the main impediment here because mm. nobody wants hysterectomy. Nobody wants to lose an organ they were born with. Right. Losing your uterus uh, is has a lot of uh, negative things that happen to women because yeah. the average age of hysterectomy in this country is 39 Right. And I've met way too many women less than 30. I spoke at Tuskegee not long mm. ago. The great Tuskegee University. And where great people graduate from. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, and three women came up to me afterwards, mm. less than 30, had already had a hysterectomy. They were in tears. No one mm. ever told them. Now they're, they, they, mm. want, and they wanted children. They're, that's not going to happen. Right. And we've had numerous children born after UFE. So that is remains possible for women. Uh, but it was tragic. These are young women. So we're not talking about old women, mm. young women, women in their twenties, thirties, forties are undergoing life altering surgery, you know? And, and again, I think the cure is worse than the disease here because fibroids are benign tumors. They're not cancer. Mm. How many, how many, and I, I, I noticed that you are adjunct, uh, at Morehouse school of medicine. Yes. Uh, and, and I was thinking about perhaps those statistics wouldn't be as such if more African American doctors uh, interned or did residencies yep. in uh, what is the interventional specific? radiology? Interve yeah, what it, it is becoming more diverse. You're right. I mean, it's predominantly male um, back in my day, uh, mm -hmm. but over much more recently, there are really. There's an emphasis on diversity, mm -hmm. um, men of color, women, other minorities are getting into the specialties, mm -hmm. um, which is great. It really, we do need to emphasize diversity. In fact, I interview prospective medical students for Morehouse, mm -hmm. um, and it's their mission to increase the diversity and, and it needs to be done. It's absolutely important. Excellent. All right, give us the information again about how to get in contact with you, Doc. Uh, website, atlii.com. Uh, Instagram, dr underscore L-I-P-M-A-N. And YouTube, Atlanta Fibroid Center. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, put your hands together for friend of the situation, Dr. John Lipman. <laughs> When we come back, we will continue with the program. I got special guests on deck, so stay tuned. You ain't going to want to miss what's coming up next. Appreciate Dr. Lipman for coming through. And uh, we got to get you back, man, because we need to continue it's, to uh, blast this, to put this on blast. You know? Thank you. Yes, it's yeah, important. No doubt. Thanks for coming through. Thank Appreciate you. you. All right, y'all. Uh, it's a situation I'm slaughtered, and I'll be black when I get back with more of this thing. So don't you go anywhere you old big head <laughs> don't touch that If it makes sense, we have to go and do it, you know. We're open. We are open, and Sandtown Pub is ready to serve you. We're taking precautions, wearing masks, wearing gloves, 
sanitizing and practicing social distancing. We've even partnered with local leaders to hand out free masks. So stop by and enjoy our outdoor patio, dine in, call ahead for pickup, get Uber Eats and DoorDash delivery, or order online at www.sandtownpub.com. Peace family, it's your girl Shelly Amonset with Sun Goddess Sense, your one-stop natural shop. We are located at 4140 Jonesboro Road, booth 225 inside the Forest Park International Discount Mall in Forest Park, Georgia. Come check us out. You can get your health and beauty items, aromatherapy, skin care, pan-African apparel, and more. You can reach us at 404-434-7963 or sungoddess underscore sense on IG or sungoddess dot sense on IG or sungoddess sense like page on Facebook. Peace. Hi, I'm Broderick Gooch. And I'm Tian Gooch. And we're Gooch's Goodies. Here at Gooch's Goodies, we specialize in delivering smiles and satisfaction to your home with our high-quality food at affordable prices. Our signature sauces and dishes will guarantee a flavor that your family will love, and that's a Gooch's Goodies guarantee. You can follow us on Facebook, DoorDash, and Grubhub. See you soon.
Same color as my sweat top on there, man. What the hell? I think I'm back. I'm... Look at that. Look at that. That's weird. That's crazy. I got lights all around, man, and I'm shucks. Indistinguishable from absolute jet black. But that's cool. <laughs> I feel good. I'm, I'm proud. I'm proud to be black. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, appreciate Dr. Lipman for coming through, man. Dude is awesome. He on that really real, man, and that's really making a difference in people's lives. And uh, I'm glad to to be able to uh, bring that kind of guest to you. You know, I don't be studying white folks, but if they if they okay and, and they are allies and attempting to do something that's helpful to black people, 
then you'll see him on the show. You know what I mean? But it ain't gonna be no like or no whole bunch. It got to be a the kind of Dr. Lipman kind of white man. You can't be the, the <laughs> other kind. Anyway, my next guest is is a self care guru and a social media influencer. Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, please join me in welcoming for the first time to the situation our dear sister, Marjorie Flory. Floor. Flory. I was right. I was right, Flory. Anyway. Sister Marjorie, what's good, sis? How you doing? Good. It's all you dead in the hood. You know it, right? I, know, I am. I am. I mean, so, there's so much soul here, so you know. Yeah. I love the hood of you can kind of feel it. Yeah, absolutely. There's yeah, no yeah. way you can miss it when you come out here. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. What part? You, uh, what part of the city you live in? Um, I'm actually in Tucker. Yeah, are you yeah. out in Tucker? Okay, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, it's it's a lot different in Tucker than it is. Yes, it is. Uh, <laughs> yes, it is. Here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> Here in Pitts in the Pittsburgh community. Absolutely. I would say Tucker is missing a lot of seasoning. You say, yeah, it is a little bland. It's a little bland. A little bland. <laughs> um so I I wanted to know this. Marjorie. First of all, where where are you from? Because you know, I I I I don't like to use words like uh, exotic. Okay. Uh, because to me that's, I don't know, it, it, it feels kind of, um, I don't know, weird, creepy, okay. you know, to say, to say <laughs> that about a human being, you yeah. know what I mean? Uh, but, but, but you are a very beautiful sister Thank and you. I was wondering, uh, where you're from, what, where your parents uh, are from and what your, uh, what is, what am I searching for? Um. Where your people from? You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my people are from Haiti. So okay. I'm one hundred percent Haitian. Okay, I say, um, I say. <laughs> man, I, man, I, lo I don't know. I love people from Haiti, man. You know what I mean? I wish I was from Haiti because the you know many people think different things when they think Haiti. Some people just immediately think poverty. Absolutely. A lot of people, you know, think you know misfortune. What I always think of is the fighting spirit. There we go. <laughs> you know, and that's what I associate with Haiti. I, I associate black independence. Yes. I associate uh, strength and yes. fortitude uh, with Haiti. So when I say Haiti, I'm saying something that it's it's a place that I that I love, and it's a people uh, that I love and that I respect because. You, it's the only people on the planet who ever kicked white folks' ass and and don't nobody and they and, and our and the country is suffering for it even yes. to this very moment yes. because your, our people were able to kick white folks' ass and put them out of the country. Absolutely. You know? We made we made an example, so then they try to make an example out of us. Yeah. Um okay. yeah. 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 And that is and, and I think that what we have to do as as educators, and I'm and I'm an educator, uh, we got to tell the story and tell it uh, in a way uh, that honors the the people of Haiti instead of uh, uh, pitying Haiti uh, for what France and other European countries have done to undermine its growth and development. Absolutely, you know? oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I remember yeah. growing up myself. Um, you know, it was hard. We got picked on. Yeah. If somebody found out, you know, you were Haitian, they were mm. coming for you. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I remember being so ashamed based on what I was seeing on TV. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't want to claim it. It mm -hmm. wasn't until I started, you know, unlearning a lot of what I was taught and doing more research on my own and then actually stepping foot on the land mm -hmm. that I realized like, okay, wait a minute. That's yeah. when the whole journey started for me, went natural, yeah. um, grew my locks out. And ever since then, like the revolution is in my veins. It runs through my blood. There's nothing I can do about yeah. it. Yeah. Transformational. Absolutely. For you. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. I, I'm, I am uh, uh, just, I, I get encouraged when, 
when people come into consciousness, you know, to a sense of a deeper sense of consciousness, um, because what that requires is, as you suggested, it requires you got to do the work to push through the lies, yes. you know, because the, this there's a a wall a wall of lies that has been constructed that has to be broken down, and is to in a, to a very real extent. Each individual person has to do the work of breaking down the wall that's in front of them. Absolutely. You know, and but then once we do it and, and the sunlight comes in and, you know, sunlight cleanses everything and it right. removes the, the, uh, the, the stench of the lies and you can begin to appreciate uh, the space, uh, appreciate the people, and, and appreciate the part of you that is a part of, of all of that. Because one day, one day, Haiti will be um, will be resurrected. Absolutely, uh, I, I do believe, and we just got to, you know, we just got to learn how to trust each other, and we got to figure out, we got to figure out how to keep people who have good intentions at the outset from being corrupted um, by the influences of of capitalism and, and white supremacy, and that's. That's that's a tough yes. job. That's a tough job because everybody we get in leadership, my Haiti, at one point or another, <laughs> and the dude that they got now like works for the CIA. Yeah. So it's like it's just yeah. it's it's crazy. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's that's where, where you from? You you from Haiti, but you, you your mother and father from Haiti. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Boston, Boston, mm. Massachusetts, um, and then I stayed there for. I think about till I was maybe kindergarten and then mm. we moved down south. We couldn't deal with the cold anymore. Yeah. Moved down south and this is where I've been. Where to here to Atlanta? Mm -hmm. So you've been in Atlanta, the you are Atlanta pretty, baby pretty much, basically. You might as well say that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you are a social media influencer. And um I I did a little research. I, I just see you just be looking pitch, pretty in pictures. What does a, <laughs> what does what does a social media influencer do? <laughs> okay, so well, um, first and foremost, um, I'm I'm definitely more than an influencer. Okay. Um, I I use my social media to share my story, to share my journey, um, my awakening, um, and then just kind of the the traumas that I've had and what I'm doing now to overcome those traumas. And I, I use social media as a platform um, to really just it, to, to teach and to inspire. And so, you know, yeah, I have a lot of nice pictures on my social media mm -hmm. and I, I like to attract people in with that. But if you read the comments, you'll see that I'm always pouring um, whether it's um, affirmations or, you know, um, it's insight or knowledge on, you know, healing and mm -hmm. um, what that looks like in that process. So, yeah. Well, that's a good good segue into my question, my next question that was in my mind. Okay. So what is self-care to you? So self-care is really prioritizing your well-being, right? And we're talking about not just financially, we're talking about mentally, spiritually, mm -hmm. emotionally. Um, and you said prioritizing. And what people often misinterpret that word, prioritize, we, we, seem, we seem to think prioritize means put things in order. Yeah. That's not what prioritize means. Prioritize means make first. Absolutely. Right? And, and you say make self-care your first concern. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. So I had to learn this the hard way. I was always putting myself second, wanting to help other people. And so what, what I found um, out, especially last year, is that I was pouring from a half-empty cup. Mm. And so when you're pouring from a half-empty cup, you're you're going to end up empty. Right. And so I wasn't able to show up consistently for the people I know were counting on me. So now, mm. by prioritizing my self-care, I'm putting me first. I'm making sure now that my cup overflows and stays mm. on full so that way, you know, mm. whatever comes or overflows from that cup, the people around me can benefit from. Mm. So what are some... Excellent. What what are some some things or practices that people can engage in order to begin the process of prioritizing self care? 
Okay, so um, first and foremost, is um, I want to be clear that it's not always a pretty journey, right? So I'll, I will say Good. what I did. Um, it started off with me removing myself from social media. Um, I wasn't listening to the radio. I wasn't allowing anything from the outside to influence me anymore. Mm-hmm. So this was a lot of time with myself, just sitting with my thoughts. A lot of things came up for me. It was a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of anger, just things I didn't know were there. Um, And, you know, I had to face my demons. So um, definitely say prioritizing, putting time set aside to pretty much just focus on yourself away from the distractions. Yeah, that's that's really important. And I think that it's... uh but as you prefaced your statement with, it also can be frightening and, yes. and scary. Um, but it is so necessary yes. uh, to be able to uh, look at one's uh, reflection, but not only that, uh, to do to take the risk of looking at one's shadow side. That part. And I think yes. that's 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 the ugly. I, for some reason, the last couple of nights I've been I don't know if it's dreaming or, or what but I'm thinking I'm thinking of like uh, some of the most rotten things that I've done yeah. in, in, in my life and and I think that at the end of it I am deciding to uh, to forgive myself yes. uh, for being a, a a dirty motherfucker sometimes <laughs> right. you, you know what I mean yeah, I feel you. Uh, and for and for because some of the times, you know, some of the things I've done, I did because I, I honestly made a mistake. Yeah. But some of the things I did, I did that shit because I wanted to, yeah. and I thought that I could get away with it. Yeah. And many times I did. However, you know, when I look back and and do that ugly work of reflecting, you know, I see, you know, what a what a, what some of the awful things that I have done. Um, that I have to try to balance out so I don't come out in the end an awful person. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Something that you said that I um, love and it resonates with me is mm-hmm. that um, it's necessary. The work is necessary. It's mm-hmm. hard, but it's necessary. Mm-hmm. The reason why I decided to even take my journey um, seriously and do the work is for the next generation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know if you're familiar of epigenetics, but, you know. Very familiar with the concept. Mm -hmm. Right. So they, you know, trauma and pain being passed on from generations and generations. Um, Wrote a little book with a piece of it in there. Yeah, (laughs) right, right. But I'm a living and walking example of it. I've, Mm -hmm. you know, um, from a young age, I was aware of pain before I understood love. Mm. And and I just you know um, I used to journal all the time when I was a little girl. Um, always had a pen and paper. A bunch of those are interesting to look at now. Oh yes, they are because it was just like I was so aware. I I got to see where my mind was at prior to being programmed. Uh. And it was like I came into the mm. world knowing a lot and then having to take in what I was being programmed to in order to survive. Yeah. And then now in my adulthood, having to go back to who I originally was and why I'm here. It's 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 a yeah, fascinating journey. Because I mean you I mean you hit on so much stuff because it's so <laughs> it's so uh it's so it's so traumatizing to be seduced into pretending yes. oh. that you think something other than what you know. Yes. Ooh, you got it. <laughs> yeah. You got it. That shit is traumatizing. It is. But that's it the is. story of black people Absolutely. in America. Uh, in Absolutely. In all the hell in the world. You know what I mean? That's the story of what... Because white people, they got a serious, man, they got a serious psych <laughs> fuck game going, boy. That thing is wicked, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, and and But I think what is so important is, is telling the story of how you engage it and overcome it. Exactly. Because that's what not only people from your generation and my generation, but those who are coming are going to have to deal with the same damn thing. Exactly. You know, and it would be exactly. it would be great to somehow give people a jump start on on that work. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yep. Because if we allow if we as long as there's a television, 
because you were saying you got to cut out this media piece. Absolutely. As long as there's a television, as long as there's social media, as long as there is a music industry, and mindful, I mind you, I said industry. Absolutely. As long as those uh, modalities of trans transmission of information. Exist as long as the public school system exists and eighty percent of the teachers are white. Yep. As long as that exists, then black people are gonna have to unlearn a whole lot of shit a before we lot. can get help healthy. A whole lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, yeah. That, that's that's been my journey. That that has been my journey and just mm. watching you know me go from you know one particular mindset to where i am now i still got mm. a whole lot of work to do however right. you know i've gotten to the point now where i use my social media um to share my story and and just to show people like hey like you're not alone if you're experiencing this this mm. is what this is and being able to um put a name behind certain things and being able to bring awareness to my community it's helping um, in more ways than I really could ever imagine, mm. you know, just by sharing, just by being honest, just by, you know, removing the mask for, because for a very long time I wore a mask. I wore mm. the mask that I was given. Right. And now the right. mask is off and it's just right. like, listen, this is hard work. But like I said, in order for our, the next generation to have the proper set of tools to navigate this life and to understand abundance in a way that we haven't, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. have to do the work. It starts yeah. with us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's just makes, it's making me think about the, uh, another program that we're kind of working on here uh, to um, see about that piece for young black, for, for black children. Yeah. Um, and because in, from my perspective, you know, everything begins with religion. It's what people say God says about people that, that people respond to. People see themselves like people say God says, like people say God sees them. Right. And what, what whites did, the game was to make us think that that God hates us. And if God didn't hate us, okay, if God didn't hate you, why God let y'all go through all this stuff? Now, you know God don't love y'all. You know, if God, if God loved y'all, why God let us be in charge of y'all? Why God let us rape you when we get ready, kill you when we get ready, and, 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 and nothing happens? If God really loved you, why would God let that happen? So I, I, I contend that the, that the questions that people raise at the outset are theological questions. What is it? Where you know where is God in the midst of what we are experiencing as a people? And once we can wrestle away control of of, of the spiritual and biblical narratives from the white supremacists, then we can. Uh, kind of get a grip on the education piece, on the political piece, on the economic piece, and on the social piece. But until, I think, this is just my perspective, until we deal with that first piece, uh, how we think God sees us, uh, we're going to have difficulty because what we think and what we feel on the inside is just inconsistent with what we're experiencing on the outside. Absolutely. You might feel loved by God. You might feel like a whole complete human that's worthy of love and respect. You might feel that way on the inside, but on the outside, it's a whole nother thing coming and people coming at us in a whole different kind of way. So it's a lot of, I think, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a lot of work to, to try to pull together. What, what do you, well, let me ask you this. Do you ever have occasion or opportunity to speak with children to to the to the little girl who who might uh remind you of the little girl that you were? Um I have had several um opportunities to do that. Um mm. I used to be a teacher um prior to the pandemic. Okay. Um, that's what I was doing. And so, you know, um What what grade? I've mm. taught everything from pre-K up until second grade. Um, okay. And I honestly was in and out of different schools. I'm going to be really honest. I got mm. kicked out of a few schools for, cool. you know, being Jeez. who I am. Like, I'm putting uh, my foot down and, and um, you know, just kind of questioning 
you know, the curriculum <laughs> and pushing it back, especially mm. around Black History Month. Right. I noticed that became a problem because I didn't want to start the narrative on we were slaves. Right. I refused to. I was right. I was showing up. And mind you, I was in mm. some of these schools were predominantly white. Mm. And I was showing up like, hey, you know, introducing black kings and queens and Mm. The parents were not having it, so yeah. <laughs> I'm coming there with that damn critical race theory. <laughs> damn critical race theory in the 1619. I don't give a damn. Uh, I saw, I saw, uh, I saw uh, it, that was a piece of uh, a city council meeting. It was on so social social media last week, okay. uh, circulating around. Uh, I can't re remember exactly where it was, but this brother was on the city council, and the white dude, uh, old dude, was on the city council as well. And the brother says, "And you gonna stop talking to me, uh, like I'm your slave?" Or and the white dude says with a straight face, "Well, you ought to be." <laughs> oh my gosh! That's wild. Yeah. That's wild. You, but I I'm I love it because I love when they when they don't lie. Yeah, I love absolutely. when they tell the truth and do it right in front of our face. So I can point to that and say, "Look, y'all, this is where we are." Now, black people tend to say, "Where are they all?" And they ain't all like that. Yes, I know some good white people, like like Doctor Lipman. <laughs> you know, I know some good white people, and 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 people. Yeah, you might know some good white people. I ain't gonna say. Ain't no GWFs out there somewhere. They they got some GWFs. But uh, we ain't talking about individuals. We talking yeah. about how systems operate Absolutely. on individuals Absolutely. and how they how they destroy us and tear us apart. What what would you like to see as an educator, as a person who is concerned about uh, people embracing a sense of care for self of uh, first what do you think that what, do, what how, do, how do you think that people are going to be able to to concentrate on that while we are yet and still in the midst of of a crisis because it's, i mean when okay i had uh, and these brothers they they can they can attest to the fact they they watched it last year. I had two nervous breakdowns. It just kept on coming in, yeah. you know. Just I just I just lost it. I just was gone. I yeah. just was showing up. I was showing up, but I I was a I was a shell, and I sent the shell uh, to to come to work, and the the real me uh, was you know left home in the basement in the corner crying, yeah. you know, balled up. Uh, how do you, how do we, you know, and I don't even know if hit reset is, is, the, is the real possibility. Yeah. But there is a possibility that, that we are coming out of um, the coronavirus dis-ease. I don't know if those things that we have learned and, what we, and that we have adapted during this time will pass anytime soon. Uh, but how do you work this self-care thing when you got crisis going on all around you? Right. Um, that's really a great question. And then I also want to commend you um, for being vulnerable and sharing what you shared about having a breakdown. These are the type of things that we need to be talking about on a a regular basis, yeah. right? Because it's real, right? Since it's, it's on film, you know. Right. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, on film. It's, it's real. I mean, yeah. it's happening to so many of us. And yeah. I, I think what's happening, especially after having to have sat down during this pandemic, a lot mm -hmm. of people, um, you know, had to sit with themselves and their, that break that we all had, mm -hmm. a lot of things start to pile up. A lot of things start to take, um, 
what's the word I'm looking for? It's just like kind of take over our minds, which is why now, you know, I'm such an advocate for speaking on things like mental and emotional health mm -hmm. within our community. It's like, we don't talk about that shit, honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, we, mm -hmm. we see it as like, oh, it's not that serious. We work out our bodies. We mm -hmm. work out, you know what I'm saying? We take care of our cars and our finances and all these different things, mm -hmm. but we're not taking care of our mental and emotional health. Yeah. And so I believe that during time like this like we have to really get to a place where we are comfortable with allowing ourselves to feel mm. really allowing ourselves to you know allow those emotions to come up and to actually process them and release them because I find that when we have emotional regulation and in internally we're in a good place it don't matter what's going on around us Seriously, mm -hmm. like I've experienced some extremely traumatic things and I'm still able to show up um, the way that I am because of my awareness of self, because of my internal landscape. So, yeah, during a time like now where things are so chaotic and, you know, I believe that what's contributing to the chaos is the chaos that's happening within each and every one of us. Yeah. Period. Yeah. We got to look at it. Yeah, And it takes a lot of. You, I think you're right. It takes strength to acknowledge that yeah. because we're encouraged to be strong exactly. and, and not admit exactly. our vulnerability exactly. and our, our pain and, exactly. uh, and our dis-ease. Yep. Something that I said a lot last year is let's make it okay to not be okay because how can people even show up for us if we're always like you said i got this right. and you know as a people it's like yeah you know like that's admirable but is it healthy right. that we're able to take on so much and still show up like it's like no yeah. and to some extent we're lying to ourselves and we shouldn't I'm, hey it is it is so refreshing to to hear someone uh, be so clear yeah. uh, about the pretense that we carry out uh, internally yeah. and that we express externally in order to, um, and, and it's really, it's really, it's really ego defense mechanisms. Yeah, we just trying to keep from disintegrating. Absolutely. And so there's a way in which we find ourselves pretending mm -hmm. uh, just so we can hold on to uh, for another day. This is a penetrating conversation, and I really appreciate you sharing. And I need to ask if you would come back, you know, and yes. see me uh, <laughs> in the not too distant future, so we can finish this conversation because we've only begun to scratch the surface. I think. Absolutely, I would definitely yeah. love to um, join you again for. Wonderful. How can people follow you on on social media and allow you to influence them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, um, my social media. I have two accounts. My mm -hmm. most active one is called the Modern Day Medusa. Mm -hmm. So that's um, underscore the Modern Day Medusa. M E D U S A. Um, underscore. And is that a, a reference to your locks? Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. Um, I can tell mm. you, um, it, it was funny because a white man stopped dead in his tracks. This was like three years ago. Mm. Um, and he was like, I'm, I'm sorry. And I was like, what are you apologizing for? He was like, well, for one, you have an astound, uh, astonishing beauty. I mm. said, okay. And he mm. was like, and then secondly, your hair looks like snakes. Mm. And that's when I'm kind of said, Hmm, I, I think Medusa was a black woman with locks. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I decided to um, call myself the modern day Medusa. So, I feel you. Yeah. I think it's going to catch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, people just have to get the, the right. Okay. I think what's going on is that uh, I'm late for class. Okay. I got yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I need to get to it. That's why I keep on going off. You All know right. what? I really appreciate you coming through, Marjorie. It was, it was a blessing. Uh, to kick it with you thank you and, for uh, having me oh my honor ladies and gentlemen sisters and brothers Marjorie Fleury <laughs> alright sisters and brothers it's been a good show uh, and it's time to get up out of here man I gotta get to school I, I still work for a living too you know what I mean uh, even in this virtual environment uh, trying to make it go down like we supposed to Okay, uh, so um, I'll see y'all tomorrow.
if the loud say the good thing. Uh, thank y'all for rolling with me today. Uh, appreciate Dr. John Lipman for coming through and uh, Sister Marjorie Flurry. And tomorrow we gonna kick it one more again, just like we supposed to do it here on the situation. Until then, peace to peace to the Archbishop and the Holy Family, to the Below community I love so well. You gotta turn me up. To the Below community I love so well. To my video engineer Craig Miggly. Uh, to my crack research team, AC in the place to be. To my producer, C to the O to the Courtney Omega. Eh, 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 eh. Stop playing, stop playing, stop playing, stop playing. You big head. And to the man in the box on special effects, sound effects, hand claps and applause, and other assorted stuff. Big, not little, the Grand Imperial Slice Match Supreme. And you, all I want you to do is love me, and I'm going to love you black. Peace to the people, power to the people, and roof to the bros. I holler. Me not like them parasites Them skin by day, them plot by night Shining on the plight of the poor and the sufferers Oh oh, cha know them a backstabbers Cha know them a bloodsuckers I can't take them vampires Cause I'm a free up, free up fighter I am a free up, free up fighter
on the trap. If it makes sense, we have to go and do it, you know. <laughs> 